Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and welcome to the Umarpreneur podcast. Today I have a very special guest with me that I've been wanting to bring on the podcast for a while and this is Khuram Malik who is the author of The Billion Dollar Muslim who is also a strategist and entrepreneur and he's just now most recently working on launching a fund for some startups. So I'm really excited to dive into what he does, give you a bit of background and also his entrepreneurship journey. Khuram, assalamu alaikum. Welcome to the podcast. Wa alaikum assalam. Thanks for having me. It's Sorry a pleasure. for taking so long to get here. No, it's a pleasure to have you and we're just we're honored to have the episode with you and i, I want to be the one to actually describe what you do because i i've been following you for quite a while and i see your posts and what is that you share and to be honest there are so many things that you're working on so i would like you if you if you had uh, if you could kind of summarize a little bit for our listeners what it is mainly that you're doing right now as an entrepreneur okay so i'm it i've actually it's much more simpler than it used to be now so uh right now i'm i'm near enough uh, all i'm doing now is girad so mm -hmm. Kirad is a it's a financing uh, it's a way of financing um, a business that actually Rasulullah was using mm -hmm. that the Sahaba were using in Medina. Uh, in the Arab world, it's known as uh, uh, in some parts of the Arab world, it's known as Marba, basically. Okay. Um, but the Sahaba used to use the term Kirad. So I, I'm really just working on Kirad, uh, but I'm working on it in two ways. Mm -hmm. One way that I'm working on it is just um, uh, uh, looking for investors or uh, you know establishing trust with investors and helping them uh, find places to put their money and then uh, connecting the investors up to businesses businesses that need a capital injection just helping them uh, get the money that they need to kind of grow their businesses mm -hmm. that's really all i'm doing now in essence um i am in parallel uh, with a couple of other people i'm working on uh, bringing this concept to the blockchain but when I say blockchain, I'm not really talking about things like Bitcoin and uh, Ethereum and all that kind of stuff. I mean, like, um, uh, it's not kind of cryptocurrency, it's like smart contracts, basically, because Kirad is effectively a contract. Mm -hmm. So it's about just basically being able to automate this process so that there doesn't have to be any manual intervention. So um, a, a startup can can field on investors and investors can just in, invest directly and they don't necessarily need me or some kind of third party in between to kind of manage that whole process for them. Yeah. So essentially, the, uh, it's it's the same. I'm working on two two sides of the same thing effectively now. Mm -hmm. That's a really interesting uh, business kind of strategy to employ. <laughs> and I really like the fact that you're considering using blockchain technology, which is an emerging technology, uh, to be able to streamline the process. Now, I want to dive deeper into your background and then go back to what you're doing now, because a lot of people listening to this podcast, there are there's entrepreneurs that are experienced, they're at different stages in their business and entrepreneurs that are just getting started or, you know, excited, curious to get started. So I want to rewind to the beginning of your journey. When was it that you made that decision or made that leap of faith to become an entrepreneur? Uh, uh, I, I, I don't know, actually. Um, <laughs> I, I kind of I, I got forced into it um, because my my dad was at a stage when he he was uh, he's, he was at the age that I am at now so he was like mm -hmm. forty one forty two and he was kind of going through his midlife crisis if you want to call it that so he was looking to get into entrepreneurship uh, he was mm -hmm. looking to get into business this is going back twenty years now um, and I had a set of skills I was able to build PCs I was working for somebody building PCs and things um, and then I had a friend of mine had asked me to uh, help him we'd kind of gotten together to kind of sell PCs to, to like, you know, neighbors and things like that. And my dad saw an opportunity and he went into entrepreneurship and I kind of got dragged into it with him. Mm -hmm. um, and then I was in, I was in that for a few years uh, with him on and off. And then I, I just, um, I had, I did have some jobs in between as well. And it just kind of became a, it, that, that kind of just became my way of life. You know, it just, be, that's all I really knew. So I, mm -hmm. I don't think there was a conscious decision at any point really. Interesting. So you were kind of thrown into that world along with your father who decided to start his own business. Yeah. What from from starting from there and then going to the point where you wrote the billion dollar Muslim, what happened in between and what sparked the idea for writing this book? Uh, I mean, well, there was a lot that happened in between, um, but we we had the first we had the first business that just broke even, and then we had a second business that did really really well, and then I kind of got tired of working with my dad, Asian families and everything, mm -hmm. <laughs> and then um, I, I I then went into my own um, IT support business, which was just really grueling and really exhausting, mm -hmm. um, and it, it didn't do particularly well, but it, uh, it kind of there was a lot of that I kind of learned in that space. 
And then um, I got into strategic consulting, just working for myself and just helping businesses. And um, at that time, I was living in London, and I just found myself having the same conversation with people over and over. Uh, the people's idea of entrepreneurship um, was quite... Um, I don't know what the right word is to use. Not necessarily undignified, but it wasn't. Mm -hmm. it, it was quite yeah. low. You know, the 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 person who's in a full time job, for example, their opinion of entrepreneurship was quite low, um, and then they they had a lot of justifications or rationalizations for you should stay in uh, you should stay in a job or you shouldn't go into entrepreneurship. There was a lot mm -hmm. of fears as well. Yeah. There was a lot of fears about um you know a lot of I, I i would find you know somebody could say uh I'm, I'm thinking of moving to another city or i'm thinking of applying for this job or i'm thinking of doing this mm -hmm. and there'd be no resistance but the minute you say i'm thinking of going into business there's a hundred people preventing you trying to hold you back from going into business yeah. which i found really bizarre i, I just found that really odd mm -hmm. and i find myself having the same um arguments if you want to call it that conversations with people over and over and i thought you know i, I want to get this down onto paper because i want to be able to refine what i'm saying mm -hmm. uh, i really want to be able to say the best i would find myself saying the same thing over and over but i would find my argument was getting more and more refined and i wanted to have a much uh, broader discussion about it so i just i really just started writing um things down just for myself and just kind of uh, you know uh, I'll, let me share this with somebody um, if they want to have this conversation with me, let me send them this PDF. And then next thing I know, I wrote another chapter. And people would keep asking me questions. I'd write something, I'd send it out, and they would say, "But what about this? But mm. what you? What about this? But what about this?" And I would find myself answering that question through the chapters. And before I knew it, I'd done like 15, 16 chapters, and it'd become a book. So, wow, a So it's inter it's an interesting concept because when I saw it, I was uh, myself really. I just loved the just the title itself even the billion dollar muslim was something that really captivated me as an entrepreneur someone who truly believed as well in you know i would say not only the want but the need for muslim entrepreneurs mm. to get into entrepreneurship to be more independent uh be more responsible for their businesses and for others and to provide different changes in the communities and all the good that comes with entrepreneurship for you is the is it because did you write this because you believe that more Muslims should be entrepreneurs. Is there another reason for that? What is it? What is no, it that was the biggest. You? That was the biggest reason. I probably mm. was the biggest reason. Yeah, um, I. I, I it, it, it depends on how far you want to. You want to take the conversation. How deep mm. you want to go, or how all know, the way, brother. How, let's go. <laughs> how, how how much of a range you want on that? But I mm. I didn't. I, there's there's so many different angles that you can come from um, mm -hmm. when you look at um, entrepreneurship as to why Muslims should be entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. the need for wealth, the fact that um, uh, right now you know the uh, people are noticing it now that you know uh, employment effectively is just outsourced slavery, mm -hmm. you know, and we need dignity in the Ummah. We need people to have their own uh, powerful positions. The fact that it um, uh, you lose so much of yourself in employment um there's so many things there were so many reasons and i wanted to get as much of that down um onto paper but i wanted to have a i wanted to have a strong argument for it as well and i didn't i didn't want the argument to be just just uh, well this is how i feel or this is what my opinion is i wanted that to be some sort of um i wanted that to, i wanted to have substance to it there's some sort yeah. of supporting argument mm -hmm. you know 100 percent. well you have moved on to now creating Kirad. So tell us a little bit about this Halal funding platform or um, you know organization fund that you're that you're currently creating. So is this going to be kind of a platform that people can go? They can post their businesses. Is it going to be more of an incubator? People can go and they can get mentorship and get funded. How how are you going to structure it? It's got um, the intention, inshallah, it's going to be more of a platform. So it's going to be like uh, I mean, uh, as you know, like the eBay or the Amazon version of you know somebody's got um, products and they you want to sell them, they stick them on eBay in a marketplace or they stick them on Amazon, and then people want to buy they just come to amazon or ebay and they and they, they come and buy so the idea with this is to kind of have a marketplace in the same way in the sense that you have a business you're selling honey or shoes or scarves or whatever it is that you're selling you can list mm -hmm. your business you can put out a proposal and say i have these this is this is what i'm selling this is the how much money i need and then investors can just come and you know or a bit like upwork and they can just mm -hmm. come and come and um 
uh, engage with you and, and uh, put together an agreement with you and off you go. So more, more like a marketplace, basically, not really right. like an incubator. Okay. What I'm doing at the moment, um, I'm doing that process manually at the moment, and I'm trying not to be incubatory about it as well, if I can help it. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just focusing on uh, just connecting businesses with uh, investors and investors with business, all, really, all I'm really trying to do at the moment. Right. Right. And what is the reason for that? Why do you feel like you want to go the platform route, really just the funding route versus the incubator route? Um, why do I want to do that? That's a good question to which I don't know. I don't, there's not, I don't think, I don't feel like there's a need for incubation. Um, I don't feel like businesses need to be incubated. I was in. I, I think businesses need help definitely. They, 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 they do need a device and stuff, but you know what? One right. thing that I've realized over the last few years, um, and I might change my opinion on this further down the line, but where I'm standing right now, I feel like people who are in business, and if they've if they've lasted more than six months and the business is taking over, I, f I don't feel like they need guidance necessarily. Mm -hmm. They need help. They need resources. They need assistance. They, but I, somebody who's can, who can make their business last six months, they generally know what they're doing. It's just a case of. They need little bits and things of information. I don't, I don't think they need to be incubated. And I, to be honest, I've, I've seen incubators. They don't really do. They don't really add that much value, as far as I'm mm -hmm. concerned. You get an office, and you get you know you get chairs, and you get a computer, and these kind of things. But I don't think that I don't think they add any real meaningful value necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, That's an interesting so. perspective. I don't know if I would agree with you on that, to be honest. But yeah. So I might change my opinion soon yeah. as well. But I, this is how I feel at the moment. Yeah, so. yeah. Well, um, I'm I'm glad that we disagree on that because I like to have different different opinions. So, I, I want to ask you this: What is it that even motivated you to launch Kidad? Why do you think like it's important for us to have this kind of platform? So, um, I, I what actually happened uh, just as soon as we hit the pandemic. I was before just before we hit the pandemic. I was supposed to be flying out to. Um, I can't remember the, which country I was supposed to be going to, but I think it was Belgium I was supposed to go to. There was a group of entrepreneurs there, Muslim entrepreneurs, uh, like 60 or 70 of them. And they wanted me to come out and uh, come and speak about something. So <clears throat> they'd also seen the book and they wanted me to speak about um, uh, um, any relevant topic. So we, we were discussing the topics, you know, maybe marketing, maybe uh, uh, strategy, maybe something else. And as they were mentioning the topics, kind of felt like they'd have already been done so many times. Yeah. And I also felt like I don't feel like people are necessarily going to take me as if we're talking about marketing or we're talking about branding. I don't think people necessarily want to take me as seriously as they might take marketing. They might take Gary Vaynerchuk more seriously than me or branding. They might take Elon, you know, what is it that I can bring to the table that is going to be higher than what these people are going to say? And they don't, they can go somewhere else for that information. What mm -hmm. can I bring to the table that's necessarily better? Yeah. So I was really struggling to find a topic that I thought was worth speaking about. And I and because it's entrepreneurs, I find a lot of people approach me and say, okay, can you tell me, what, can you give me tips on writing and how to write a really good book and get it out there and stuff. But entrepreneurs are not really interested in writing another book necessarily. Yeah. So um, we couldn't come up with a good topic. And then um, for, for whatever reason, the topic of finance came up. And the brother, the brother that was dis discussing it with me, he was saying that, you know, we've got 70 entrepreneurs here and we're all struggling to get finance for our businesses because we don't want to go to the bank. We don't want to take out a loan because of RIBA. And we don't want to be in the, we don't want to be the VC or the angel investing world either because they take a stake in your business and, you're, you know, they, we don't want to give the control of our business away. Mm -hmm. So we're stuck between a rock and a hard place. We don't know where to go. And it just so happened, I'd, at that point, I'd been in the VC angel investing space for a couple of years. And I'd been getting more, learning more and more about capitalism, about how insidious capitalism actually is. I've been learning about why VC investing is so dangerous, um, and which is not so obvious on on, on the face of things. Mm -hmm. Why angel investing is actually quite dangerous as well. Um, the pitfalls of all of that stuff. And so, and 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 then I just started learning about Kiraad and things. And so I said to them, I said, actually, I have a topic. If you, if finance is your, the biggest pain point that you have. I actually have a topic that I'd love to to present uh, because it's something that I've been kind of I've been wanting to vomit out already. It's something that I've really been wanting to share with people, but it's not something that I can share within sixty seconds. I need to be able to present it. I need to be able to uh, you know really kind of draw it out. So so they they love the idea of that. And then um, uh, I, as soon as I got off the call, I, I, wrote, I wrote the outline of that presentation in less than fifteen minutes. Got a notepad. And I wrote the whole thing out because it was so that, that's how much interested I was in this topic. 
So I, I planned the whole presentation out um, in, in less than 15 minutes on a piece of paper. And then I had to move, I had to move out of London a month or two later. And then obviously COVID got worse in a lot of ways, you know, the whole pandemic situation got worse. And then for one reason or the other, I didn't end up presenting to them. Mm. Um, but I, in that time, I'd been posting a lot on Facebook. Uh, I'd been posting about, you know, how the economy is changing, how the world is changing. Uh, in, because I talk a lot about kind of macroeconomic factors. Sometimes I talk about macroeconomic factors. I talk a lot about like um, the attitude towards money and these kind of things. And I was talking about that a lot. And then I was approached uh, by a brother who's the head of the Istanbul Muslim Collective. So it's a group of expats in uh, Istanbul. And uh, he spoke to me and he said, uh, look, uh, there's a lot of people here um, that um, I'm trying to get them to listen to what you're saying because, you know, I see your posts and they're going in one direction and you're saying something else and I, I just can't get them to, to, to listen to what, you, you know, I want them to do what you're saying because I really have a lot of faith in what you're saying. Um, so we spoke about that. He said, look, I'd, I'd love if you could present something. And I said, actually, it so happens. I've put I'd, by that time I'd, I'd put the actual formal presentation together. I said, "Look, I've put a presentation together. I really, really want to present this to you because I think this is the topic that we should all be speaking about." So then, in January of 2021, I presented that to um, I think altogether it was about 250 people. Mm -hmm. It was over Zoom, of course. I spent two hours presenting it. I got to the end, and everybody was like, "Wow, that was intense!" I didn't realize how intense it was. Um, and and so it was, and it was, it, it, you know, it, it, the words used were, it was a real game changer because it was, I was really coming from a place that nobody had spoken about before. I, I really kind of deconstructed how bad VC investing actually can be, debt-based financing, the, the effects it has on society. It really, really, really went into depth on that. And that, and that presentation mm -hmm. is still online if anybody wants to see that. Where can people watch it? I'm curious. Uh, it's on, um, it's on my YouTube channel anyway. So I'll post you something. If, if people want the live presentation that took place that's on my youtube channel okay, if people awesome. just want the slides they're on speaker deck so i can i can post you those two links after this awesome. so they can do either of the two and i've still I've, I've since created lighter and more abbreviated versions of that presentation but at the end of that presentation one of the things that i put in there was um that kirad is very conducive to the blockchain mm -hmm. or the blockchain is very conducive to kirad so this idea of smart contracts i didn't know anything about smart contracts at the at that time um, I knew about blockchain, but I didn't know much about smart contracts. Mm -hmm. So I, I put out a um, uh, like a, a feeler or a request for help to say if anybody wants to get in, involved and wants to put this smart contract together um, for for Kirad, then please get involved. So I had I had a number of people contact me, and I said, look, this is the technology stack that I'd like to be able to use. And uh, a few the, uh, a few people that got in touch, they, they just said, oh, this is this is going to be too difficult um, just in terms of, you know, the mm -hmm. time commitment that they have and the time commitment that this requires. Yeah. They said it was going to be too difficult. So I then ended up setting out doing it myself. So I started writing the smart, smart contract. I learned how the programming language. I started wow. learning how to write the smart contract myself. I, 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 was, I moved really, really slowly. I'd had a baby as well at the same time. Um, and you know, brand new baby wow, <laughs> in the house. So yeah. it was quite tough to be writing it, you know, you're trying to code sure. and you're getting interrupted with the baby crying and nappy changes and everything else. <laughs> so, um, and then eventually I, I found a couple of other people because I wanted to hand it over to people that I could trust. So eventually I found uh, a couple of other guys um, that I could pass some of the work to. So there, there's this brother now who's working on the, on the actual smart contract. But again, it's going slowly, and there's another brother who's working on the front end. So uh, a brother in Mexico and a brother in who's from Indonesia, but he's, 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 he flies around all over the place. Mm. Um, so they're working on it um, uh, at the moment, and then um, because it took because it's been taking so long, I thought you know, um, and, and the question kept coming up because um, I, I speak, I'm, I'm run into entrepreneurs all the time you know for one reason or the other mm -hmm. and i was still uh, i was still writing and talking about the macroeconomic situation which is getting worse and worse and then a number of people st start contacting me and saying i've got a pot of money i don't know what to do with it i've got some savings or i've received some inheritance money or um uh, I, I got a windfall from here or i whatever it is and i i want to do something with that money what shall i do and i, I kept just saying gold and silver just put your money in gold and silver and they, and they kept saying yeah, that's great for the. That's great as a hedge against inflation and a long term bet. But I want something that will make my. You know, I want something that will make my money work for me. I want to multiply it. Mm -hmm. And I, I didn't have an answer for them. And then uh, about six months ago, one particular investor he approached me, 
and he said um uh, I, I want to invest this money somewhere and at that point i there was a project that i'd been made aware of it wasn't it was some blockchain project that i'd been made aware of i said look why don't you i said look it's very high risk it's very high ticket it's very high risk but um you could try this if you wanted to but i want to make absolutely clear it's very high risk and i don't know that much about the project at this moment in time mm -hmm. and he said uh he said look i i i uh i want to do it but i'd rather just give the money to you and you do it. i don't have to get involved with all that stuff right. why don't you just do it for me and i said okay next thing i knew i had twelve thousand pounds in my bank account yeah. you know a minute later and so i went and did the investment for them and then i had another 20 20 or 30k a week later and you know and the money was just pouring in and they were asking me to invest in this project and that project didn't actually go that well it did it's i don't know how well it's going to go at the moment it didn't go particularly well but mm. um I ended up learning a lot from that over the last four, five, six months. I ended up developing other relationships like that within within the last five or six months. There's a number of uh, different investors now, and I've been having the same conversation. So it's a lot of um, it's just other Muslims that are um, that have savings that want to. You know, it's not like some bank. It's not some big private equity institution. It's just other Muslims that are, you know, mid net worth. That that have a certain trust in me that want to be able to invest their money somewhere. So that's all that is. That's where the funding is coming from. Right. And what what is Qirad exactly? How does it work as a concept versus traditional investing? So uh, traditional investing, um, so VC investing or angel investing, they take an equity stake in your business. Yeah. Right. So if you, you you have a business, they will they will use a particular means to invest in your business, and whatever that means, and they will either say, okay, you're doing hundred grand in revenue a year. 100k a year in revenue and you could probably reach say 2 million in in 10 years so we'll value at you at 2 million for example and then they will take a stake in your business okay well we're giving you because we're valuing you at x amount we're going to give you 50,000 pounds or 200,000 pounds or dollars and then we're going to take a 20% stake in your business so you get a, a chunk of money um and then but they now have a, a certain amount of ownership over your business they can they can start calling the shots for you Mm -hmm. And with debt-based financing, obviously you're, you've got interest repayments, and you, you, the, you know you have to build to, put, to even get that money. You've got to put collateral up anyway, right? right? So if you don't have the collateral, you're not going to get that money in the first place. Mm -hmm. And then it, it, get, it, get, it goes much more deeper than that. It gets pretty. It gets a lot more insidious than that. But that's kind of the high level. With Girard, there's no equity stake. So <clears throat> if I if I invest in, let's say you sell um, sports shoes. Mm -hmm. And I invest in your business. I'm, I don't get an equity stake in your business. I don't get to call the shots. You get to call the shots. I get to give you the money, and then you get to decide. What, you get to decide uh, the profit share that I'm going to have from you. You get to decide uh, where you're going to sell those products, uh, who you're going to take on to assist you. I, I don't get a say in any of that. So you are the Kirad agent. The entrepreneur is the Kirad agent. And that investment um, doesn't. It, it's not an investment in your business as such. It's an invest. It's an investment in the inventory. So it's a very uh, short-term kind of investment. So let's say let's say you want to buy 100 pairs of shoes and, you, and you're shifting them over. So you might say, look, um, each you know I need to buy 100 pairs of shoes. I don't have the funds right now, but they cost five dollars a pair to buy. So I need to buy a thousand uh, pairs, and I'm mm -hmm. going to sell them over in the U.S. for ten dollars, for argument's sake. Mm -hmm. So he's, and then you say, well, on a per unit basis, uh, you know, it's going to cost me say a thousand dollars for the marketing, a thousand dollars for shipment. A thousand dollars for taxes, a thousand dollars for distribution, a thousand dollars to pay people to help me, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, right? Mm -hmm. So you're at ten thousand dollars now. So okay, let's say let's say you're going to sell them for twenty dollars a pair. So you're at ten thousand dollars to buy five hundred shoes. No, or actually, I should I've got the math completely wrong on this. <laughs> um, but um, anyway, there's let's an just amount say, to buy. There's yeah, an amount yeah. exactly. You, you you break it down on a per shoe basis. So let's yeah. say, let's say if for five hundred shoes, even if there were five dollars to buy mm -hmm. um, each, which is actually two thousand five hundred. But let's say the whole thing came to five thousand dollars, including marketing, distribution, everything. Mm -hmm. Then you, what you're saying is each pair of shoes actually cost you ten dollars. So the five dollars for the raw cost of it, and then you know a dollar per shoe for marketing, a dollar per shoe for distribution, et cetera, et cetera, right? Mm -hmm. So it's cost you ten dollars uh, altogether. Now you're selling it for twenty dollars, so you're making ten dollars per sh per pair of shoe. Mm -hmm. So you could, if I'm the investor in you, you could say to me, okay, I'm going to sell it for twenty dollars. I'm willing to give you uh, three dollars per per pair of per each pair of shoe that I sell. Mm -hmm. So as soon as you sell those shoes, let's say you sell all five hundred, I then get. Fifteen hundred dollars, 
I gave you five thousand dollars and I get fifteen hundred dollars back. So all I've done is I've effectively purchased that inventory. Is what I've done that stock. That's what I've effectively done. Mm -hmm. um, and so I have an ownership on that inventory with you until it sells. That's that's all it is. It's all how Kirad works. So Kirad cannot really be used for give me the money and I want to take on five staff or I want to manuf I want to take it on for manufacturing or I want to take it on because I want to I want to do Facebook ads and things. It's literally I need a capital injection to buy more inventory. And I will give you a cut of each of the sales. You know, I'll give you a cut of um, each sale that is made. It's as, it's as basic as that. Um, and you can get more kind of uh, granular with that in the sense that what where I want to bring the blockchain is the idea of it is that as soon as you sell each pair of shoe, you pay the investor back their money straight away. Mm. So if you've got 100 pairs of shoes and you sell one today and one tomorrow and one day after, then the investor is getting their principal sum back, that $5.00. Plus the profit, they're getting back as soon as that sale is made. So they, they, they're seeing their money come back in immediately. I want it to be as real time and as fast as that. Right. And so if I understand correctly here, so what happens is you're essentially buying product for the business or helping them buy product. And then you make your money back when they pay you back your investment plus a stake of the sales that you help generate yeah. through the product yeah. that you purchased. Yeah. Right. That makes sense. And so this is a straightforward way now. In these scenarios, in this platform, what happens if someone gives the capital injection to the entrepreneur, but then they don't succeed in selling the product? Is, are you going to have a certain vetting system to have established businesses that yeah. have rotating, you know, rotating uh, essentially cycle, sales cycles and that are pretty consistent? Yeah. So, so the the, the there's two aspects of uh, of the, the the vetting that you're supposed to do, and I'm still mm -hmm. kind of putting things together for that. I'm still kind of in the learning process. So I understand it conceptually. I don't know what this is going to look like in practice. Mm -hmm. One is obviously salesability. So you know, um, if you've got somebody who's already got a proven track record, that's always going to be better than. So I, I've been approached by different businesses. So I was approached by. One business, for example, who already got their products in uh, Holland and Barrett, which is, I, I don't know which, which country you're in, but... Uh, Canada. Oh, you're in Canada. Do you yeah. have a Holland and Barrett there? No, we have the Bay, which is a similar concept. It's like the, okay, the, so this really big, like, uh, you know, general store, but like with good quality products, like high fashion, etc. Right. Yeah. Okay. So this is like alternative health products that they have. Holland and Barrett okay. has like, oh, okay, they okay, have okay, like okay, essential okay. oils and they do like organic okay. uh, uh, shampoo and organic, you know, it's, it's that kind of stuff. Okay. And these guys have essential oils in, in their, in those stores already. And they've just assigned a partnership with John Lewis, which is a bit like your, um, the U S version of Bloomingdale's maybe mm -hmm. something like that. Um, or Nordstrom. I don't know. I don't know American brands. Right, yeah, very... Nordstrom. Yeah, that's what I, when I when you mentioned Holland, that's what I was thinking of, like the Bays and the pretty much the Canadian Nordstrom as well. Okay, yeah, okay, okay. So they would. Um, uh, so so they already have a proven sales uh, pipeline. So mm -hmm. it's very clear that if if they were to get the capital injection, that product is going to sell. It's quite obvious. Mm -hmm. um, there's another company that's approached me, um, and they have their their, their honey is being sold in four thousand stores in the U.S. Mm -hmm. and they they get actual purchase orders. So they, they get a purchase order a month in advance to say, we'd like to buy this many pots of honey off you. So you literally, you see the purchase order, you know that sale is, good, is as good as made. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that so number one is sales ability. But I, I was approached by a guy who was trying to, trying to he's, he's somebody who was working for, uh, was working for GQ magazine. Mm -hmm. And he now wants to set up his own brand um, and sell um, uh, apparel for um, mm -hmm. men's apparel. But he doesn't, have, even though he works for GQ, he doesn't have a proven sales record. Right, so in that that even though that the there's there's a certain amount of trust and credibility there that he has, you don't know if that product's going to work because mm -hmm. it's, it's, it doesn't have a proven sales ability. Yeah. So that that would not be highly um, uh, uh, you, you you don't want to be highly inclined towards that something mm -hmm. like that because there's no proven sales ability there. Right. So that's one side of the vetting. The other aspect of vetting is uh, how uh, trustworthy um, is the person that you're investing the money in because they could go rogue with the money. Um, which does happen. So the way that it used to work in places like Medina and in the Ottoman Empire is that that person used to be part of a guild. So you, for example, if I if I was investing in you, you would say, okay, well, I'm part of the Umarpreneur Guild. There's a hundred of us. We all work together. We all look after each other. And so you'd have you'd have 99 other people vouching for you. Mm. And then uh, there's an impression that I have of the guild in itself. Does this guild have a good reputation? Uh, are they well, you know, well, well known? Are they, are they the people, you, you know, do, do we know anybody else in the guild, et cetera, et cetera. And then all those people would vouch for you and they would vouch for you as uh, even, even insofar as they wouldn't let you into their guild until they trusted you anyway. So that there's already something there in that. And 
if and they know that if you go rogue or you mess me about as an investor, they'll throw you out of the guild. And if you're out of the guild, you you can no longer do business. We don't live in that world right now, but that's how it used to work. So yeah. you, you were very you know you don't want to be uh, riling up the guild members in any way. You got you've got to have a good relationship with them. Um, because you, the, your reputation is going to spread, people are going to know he, he doesn't yeah. get on with this guild, etc. So it's re, it's all about reputation. But also, those ninety nine other people are also saying, uh, at least a handful of the people within that guild are saying, if he runs off with your money, we vouch for him. We will we'll give you your money back. Mm -hmm. So if I give you five thousand dollars, there's five other people saying I'm going to underwrite him. If he runs off with your money, I will give you. You know, between the five of us, we will find a way to give you your money back. Yeah, but. That that doesn't apply in the event that you have a loss. If you have a loss, it's a shared risk. Yeah. So if you genuinely, even though you had the sales in the bag and everything sounded great and everything was you know hunky dory, and then you got hit with a you know with a pandemic or something cyber attack or whatever else happened, and for whatever reason those products didn't shift, that's a genuine loss. In which case, the other guild members they're not, um, you know, they're not liable. Yeah, they're not yeah. responsible. That makes sense. That's a really interesting concept. I really like this idea of the guild and the tribe, actually, that you're mentioning. And it, it, it's going to be very interesting to see how you're going to replicate that in modern times. And I guess you can really just go the, re the way that you mentioned of having underwriters that are going to vouch, kind of like even when someone wants to rent an mm -hmm. apartment, right? And they're like, if yeah. someone doesn't have good credit, well, hey, we need someone else to sign on this contract. They'll be responsible for the payments if you don't pay. So it's a similar concept to that, which is interesting. But I really like this idea of having this tribe or this guild that can vouch for you and kind of this organization behind your back that I can also be like, hey, I'm part of this. Um, is that is that something that you you would consider implementing? I mean, just thinking about that, it's, it would be such a it would be complicated implementation, wouldn't it? Yeah. So I mean, guilds. Uh, there's much more to the concept of guilds. Uh, the mm -hmm. ultimate thing here is the the guild is incredibly powerful. The mm -hmm. the uh, people that were self employed, you know, in Medina and in uh, you know in, in the Ottoman Empire, they're all part of a guild mm -hmm. because the guild. You, that's how you're learning your craftsmanship. craftsmanship. You know, you want to learn how to make mm -hmm. shoes. You join a guild that 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 deals with mostly with shoes, and there's somebody else. They've got the machines. And they've got the craftsmanship and they're teaching you how to do it and they, they have somewhere where they can sell those shoes so you just you you join them and you are a semi-autonomous agent mm -hmm. so you, you're part of the guild in terms of there is a certain responsibility that you have towards the guild and the guild has towards you but you are still a free man or a free free woman basically even right. though you're part of that guild so you're not employed in the same way that you know in, in employment you're not really part of a guild. You, you it's a dictatorship. Mm -hmm. The guild. I would. I don't like using the term democracy, but it's kind of like the difference between when you're on when you're going on a plane journey. You, you effectively do every whatever the, the the pilot says. You know, he decides when you're going to set off. He decides when you're going to land. He sets the protocols as to you know uh, security protocols, everything, and you you're just sat there like cattle, and you just do you're just you know you're transported and that's it. Yeah. But a guild is more like a car journey. You're you're in a car with a group of other guys. You have a say in when when you're going to depart, when you're going to arrive, when you're going to stop, who's going to drive. You can take it in turns to drive, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. It's a, it's a different. It's more collaborative. Yeah. But you're still a free person within that car to an extent as well. So it's more like that. So it, so guilds are very uh, powerful. You know, um, they, they have a huge history. Um, if anybody ever wants to look into it, look into the word synf or sinaf. So sinaf, okay. I think, is the pure plural of guild, and synf is the the uh, the singular. I think, and I think I'm not sure which scholar wrote about them, but I think Ibn Khaldun. I know he's mm -hmm. popular in some camps and not others. Yeah. He 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 wrote about them, but uh, Doctor Humaira Shahid, she's done some work on guilds. Uh, Sheikh Umar Vadilo, he's he's done podcasts on guilds. He talks about guilds. So there's a lot that's been said about guilds. So so the concept of guild is even more powerful than Kirad, because everything else everything else kind of uh, um, connects into the guild. But I have, I believe, I believe, I don't know for sure. I believe I'm the first person in the world to actually implement the guild system on a blockchain. Mm -hmm. I believe I am the first. I could be wrong. Well, it's the first I time I hear it. about it. And I'm pretty into crypto, so I it's an interesting yeah, but concept. Yeah, they've, sure. they've got DAOs, haven't they? So they have yeah. these decentralized autonomous, autonomous organizations that are mm -hmm. supposed to be a bit like a cooperative, a bit mm -hmm. like a guild, but they're not really operating like a guild, really. Yeah. But I've, I've I, when I started programming last year, I actually implemented a system where 
it, if I've got a guild, for example, and you want to join my guild, um, if there's four other people, you actually have to get approval from me, then you have to get approval from four of the other people, and it has to be a, it has to be an actual signatory that you have to get from four other people to say. And if even one of those people say no, I don't want this person in my guild, you can't join. Mm. That system I have already implemented into the blockchain as part of a smart contract, and I think I'm the first person in the world to do it. I think, but I haven't finished it. it is, the comp the coding is uh, complicated, but it's uh, it's definitely um, been started. Amazing, um, amazing. And so the whole concept of this whole crowd thing is all going to you know the idea of uh, people being able to put their businesses up. They're going to have to be part of a guild. So somebody will have to come along, create a guild then bring four or five other people in uh you know uh, or as many well, at least a minimum of four or five people create that guild and then they can start and each person in that uh, guild can then start putting proposals up and say i have this proposal i need money for this i need money mm -hmm. for this and then you know this the whole thing is part of a guild i've got screen designs and things yeah. uh, of what that needs to look like but it hasn't been implemented mm -hmm. when do you when when's your eta for people for launching at least like some sort of mvp uh have? last october Okay, so last October, you mean like it was it's launched already, or it's no, been no, delayed? it was it's it's been delayed. Okay, it's, it's, it's taking a very long time. There's been right. um, there's been other unfortunately, there's been other kind of uh, there's been some personal emergencies. There's mm -hmm. been other kind of external factors. There's been a whole host of stuff that's really slowed things down, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, and I can only really give the work to people that because smart contracts. If you if you're in the crypto world. You know very well, smart contract, somebody put some sort of exploit or backdoor in there, it's incredibly dangerous. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to be responsible for somebody's uh, wallet to be completely drained of all of their funds. Yeah. So I can only really give the work to people that I trust. Um, I could go out there and just hire somebody, you know, on yeah. some some developer marketplace, but but the risk of that is quite high. I understand. So because of that, I uh, you know, and, and so the people that I trust, they want to do the work, but they, you know, they're... Uh, They've got other commitments, so that it's going very slowly. But having said all of that, while I've been doing this crowd manually now, I've also realized that actually the specifications and the concept that I've put together for this thing, they're, they're, they're good in principle. But what I'm do because of the work that I'm doing now, I'm actually learning a lot more in terms of the ground reality, which will further inform the smart contract. So a couple of businesses that I spoke to, I think it was a week ago, or last week or the week before, when I spoke to them and I said to them, I said, look, you need at least four other people to be able to vouch for you. Uh, the first lady came back to me. She said, I can't, I can't get four other people to vouch for me. And she goes, she goes, I might, even if I can get them to vouch for me in terms of a uh, character reference, I definitely can't get them to underwrite mm -hmm. the investment. And then she said that, you know, if, if, if they're going to underwrite the investment, why don't I just take the money from them in the, in, instead? Um, and so there's these kind of uh, challenges that I'm now coming up against. And now I'm thinking, okay, how, how do I, 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 how, how, do I, how do I work around that? Because the underwriting or the credit reference, it, it needs, there needs to be some sort of legal enforcement. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there, there's got to be some sort of legal endorsement and legal enforcement attached to that as well. I've got to be able to enforce this idea that if you run away with the money, that I can, that the, whoever invested in you can get their money back. It needs to be legally right. enforceable. Yeah. You know, I, I mean, the crypto world at the moment is it's such such a wild, wild west. Somebody runs off with your money, you've got no recourse. Yeah. Unless it's such a large amount of money that the FBI gets involved, you don't have any recourse, and we we can't really afford to do that with the uh, the funds of you know Muslims and things. So for sure, would you, do you do you plan to also have it implemented in, in a way where, for example, it will actually be a cryptocurrency where people can, for example, buy the cryptocurrency itself or the token itself, and then those contribute to let's say a whole maybe shared fund pool that can be distributed to certain entrepreneurs like is it is the element of having the like having this available to all investors even if they want to put in something as little as like ten dollars by just buying like let's say you know one of one coin or two coins of this currency but when, when, you're, when you're buying this the funds will go towards let's say investing is this and you can expect this much return or whatever kind of like proof of stake but you would if you know what i mean so structuring it in a way where people can buy into the currency and that also means kind of almost like investing in these startups so uh if you if you if you were to talk about it on a per unit basis the mm -hmm. the idea is and this is again why it needs to be a smart contract because to do this manually is much harder yeah. but the idea is to to allow people to invest on a per unit basis for, for mm -hmm. sure so mm -hmm. if you want to buy 500 if you want to buy 500 pairs of shoes and each one is costing five dollars to buy then it's it's it makes it should make no difference to you as the business owner 
as to whether you get 500 investors buying one unit each or you get one investor buying 500 units. So we want to we want to be able to break it down to on a per unit level in that sense, for mm -hmm. sure. We definitely want to be able to do that because the, the blockchain should allow that that level of reporting. Right. And and then, then it actually makes it a lot more powerful because then you can have a 12 year old kid who can invest with his birthday money and start to apply, multiply yeah. it, right? Yeah. And that becomes incredibly powerful at that, uh, you know, it becomes grad on steroids basically, which is why mm -hmm. blockchain is so conducive. So we definitely want to do that. In terms of the cryptocurrency aspect, um, as much as, I, I mean, I have spent time in the cryptocurrency world, Bitcoin and Ethereum and, and all of this. Um, I don't want to go down the route of the the Western concept of cryptocurrency at this stage. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm waiting for uh, China to make their moves. I'm waiting for Russia to make their moves. They're making a number of, and Turkey as well. All three are making a number of blockchain moves. Um, at some point, it's quite likely that they will release a a token of some sort that will be pegged to an actual currency, mm -hmm. right? As an actual state-backed currency. So right. whether it's yuan or whether it's ruble or whether it's lira or whether it's all three, because you know the crypto the the tokens that you have at the moment, even if you create your own token, the issue with your own token is that they all they all get subject to a lot of volatility. Yeah. Um, and then there's a whole host of other issues. You can't really be afford, you know, if, if I'm investing in you and, and I give you $100 to buy 20 pairs of shoes, you know, and tomorrow that could have bought me 50 pairs of shoes. I'm just right. going to keep waiting. Right. Or if or if tomorrow that, that, you know, by the time you go and buy those shoes, right. there's just too much volatility. Right. So... Um, what if the volatility is priced in? What if the, I'm, I'm just shooting ideas here because I think yeah. this is a cool discussion. But what if the volatility was priced in? Like literally, the volatility comes from the fact that like the investments within the fund are growing. If that makes sense, you know. And if they're not, okay, you, like if, all of that stuff is worth considering. Right, I haven't looked right. into it hard enough just yet. But I'm just my, throwing things out there to be honest. Yeah, but, <laughs> but my 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 long term uh, my long term uh, uh, idea is. Uh, as soon as a state-backed cryptocurrency is launched, because they're, they're due, mm -hmm. so whether it's the yuan, which is the e renminbi, basically, or whether it's the ruble, because the, the China's plan basically is they, they've already been rolling it out in China anyway. Mm -hmm. So they launched the e renminbi there, I think, about a year ago, and it's and I think it's operating in three or four cities. So China's going completely cashless now anyway. They're already re relatively cashless already, but they now they now have a blockchain-backed. Um, uh, uh, um, Current uh, cryptocurrency, effectively, right? Mm -hmm. Which uh, which of the West is calling the CBDC, but this is different. It's not it's not the CBDC in the same way that what the West is trying to put together. So if if they if they end up launching that, and the blockchain platform that we want to go on uh, probably is going to be uh, something China or Turkey or R Russia related anyway. By the time we end up launching this thing, so they will uh, they will have a currency that will be. That whatever their token is, it will be it will be legal tender. That's the first thing. Mm -hmm. So if you make an investment in something and you get that investment money back, it's already legal tender. So you can put it straight into your bank account. So there's none of this kind of worries about money laundering and evading ta tax evasion and all that kind of stuff. You 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 do away with all of that. But also, um, it will be stable. And it, you know, I know there's a lot of stable coins already, you know, Bitcoin yeah. and Ethereum, but they're not that stable. Mm. It's an interesting term to use when it, when your when your coin can move anywhere between three to twenty percent in a day. That's mm -hmm. that's pretty scary. It's not very stable. Mm -hmm. But something like an e renminbi will become, and especially if it, you know, there's already talk about the ruble being uh, going back to a gold standard. If that goes back to a gold standard, and then they'll end up launching the ruble on on the blockchain, that will be incredibly stable. But wouldn't yeah. the wouldn't the wouldn't the war right now with Ukraine be affecting be affecting the, any plans that they had? I mean, they're being cut off from the entire world at the moment, right? Well, I mean, I don't know how political you want to get right here, right. Uh, but uh, uh, everything everything that is being reported in the Western because I've been following this, mm -hmm. right? I have been following this for quite a long time. Everything that's being re reported in the in the Western uh, media is is effectively a, uh, uh, an admittance of uh, any wrong that they've done themselves. Mm -hmm. So I, I, let me explain what that means. I'll give right. you an example of what that means. Uh, I'll give you two examples. So the first mm -hmm. example, right? You know, banks, uh, all the ATMs in the world, generally speaking, even if you go to a place like Singapore, generally speaking, ATMs and, and the computer systems that work inside the banks, 
they run uh, Microsoft Windows. Mm -hmm. So uh, you try and you try and um, put your card into a machine in Singapore, for example. The likelihood of it uh, of it running Windows ninety five is like very very high. Almost probably all the ATMs in Singapore run Windows ninety five, so they run on the Microsoft operating system. Uh, Russia has been developing their own operating system for the last three or four years now, if not longer, maybe fifteen years. I don't know how long they've been doing it. They've already moved the majority of their banks over to an operating system that isn't Microsoft, mm -hmm. which is a world first. China, uh, possibly China is possibly the same anyway. So uh, what that means is that they are that you know if uh, Bill Gates or whoever is Satya Nadella tomorrow if he decides that, well we're going to shut down all of your banks because we can shut down Microsoft Windows we can do some remote code execution mm -hmm. you can't do anything to Russia now it doesn't do anything mm -hmm. and this the the biggest thing that uh, uh, America has been trying to do is these SWIFT sanctions right so to, just to explain to your audience how SWIFT actually works so. If I am if I'm Russia and I'm selling wheat to India, for example, mm -hmm. and the same, same thing works with China as well, I have to convert my Russian ruble into US dollar. Then the US dollar uh, is used to trans transfer that money across. And then that US dollar is then converted into the rupee, mm -hmm. right? <clears throat> and what happens as a result of that, while that is taking place, the protocol that's used for that is known as SWIFT which uh, was invented by America and is what like the, the probably 80 or 90 percent of the world actually uses is the SWIFT protocol. So when um, so when I when I as Russia do trade with India, America actually profits from that. America makes money from that. Mm -hmm. So I'm selling wheat to India, which has got nothing to do with America. Yeah. But America profits from it because of the currency exchange that takes place. And that's what gives America its uh, its economic power or has done mm -hmm. so, uh, up till now. And so the way that they then implement economic sanctions, they don't have to do anything with the military. The way they implement an economic sanction is if Russia doesn't comply, they say to Russia, if you don't comply, you don't do what we're telling you to do, we will switch the SWIFT protocol off. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> even though India is going to Russia and saying we want to buy some gas or oil from you, Russia is not able to sell that to India, even though they have the means to do it. And India is willing to pay because they don't have access to the protocol that allows them to do it. It's an actual piece of technology, which is SWIFT. Mm. That's right. where they need the blockchain, though. <laughs> use <That's>, crypto. <laughs> right. So, you, yeah, exactly. So you say that. But China has its own implementation called Union Pay, mm -hmm. which is uh, much more advanced than SWIFT and much more powerful than, than SWIFT. And either is already on the blockchain or is coming to the blockchain very, very soon. Very, very soon. Mm -hmm. Russia has just switched over to Union Pay for all of its transactions uh, about in the last two weeks or so, which is, again, a world first. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now what happened is, uh, I think it was two days ago, India just bought some oil from Russia in, in rubles, rupees. Mm -hmm. Right. So the conversion took place directly from rubles into rupees and they used union pay for that payment so swift has been completely bypassed now so now any sanction that america is now applying to russia is not working mm -hmm. right so yeah. that's just one example of many so there's a lot of other things that america has done in the same way putin has now turned around to america um yesterday and said if you want because europe is like 80 percent dependent on uh, i think it's 80 percent of no sorry i think it's 40 percent dependent on um russia for for its gas supply mm -hmm. europe uh, so putin has just now turned around and said to them you want to buy gas from us go ahead but you can only pay for it in rubles mm -hmm. so that now actually puts the ruble in a stronger position than the dollar it puts the it puts russia in an economically stronger position than whatever is going on in uh you know with ukraine and with america so it actually makes russia a lot more stable than it would seem than what the mainstream media would have you believe Mm -hmm. They're actually because China, in terms of tech, is is light years ahead of the West. Because China is such a yeah. it's, China is such a self contained country. Yeah. It's such a thing to itself, and Russia has been largely like that in a lot of ways as well. So we don't, you know, we see we see um, Teslas, you know, do not sixty in three seconds, and we see you know the M one MacBook, which can render video eight times faster than than anything we've ever seen before, and we think America is a leader of technology. It's not true. China has a lot of tech um, that we just haven't seen. Mm -hmm. And and Russia has a lot of infrastructure that we just haven't seen, doesn't get talked about. 
just because um, American uh, America is much better at design, right? They're very good at like creating fancy laptops and creating fancy iPhones, and you know, yeah. uh, and they're very good at the marketing and the design. But in terms mm. of creating technology that that creates a very real um, is a very real utility, China is way ahead, way yeah. way ahead. Just uh, you see the difference between if I go to I go to an um, a, like an English acupuncturist, right? And you see the setup that they have, and then you go to the Chinese one. You go to the Chinese acupuncturist. They have a gadget for everything. They have a gadget for grabbing all the needles with a magnet. They have a USB music player. They have a this. And they have mm. gadgets for everything, and you just don't mm. see those things in the West. Yeah. So they're way, way ahead. For sure. And it's interesting because a lot of people don't see. Uh, I guess they don't really realize, but I guess now well, a little bit more. But China is positioning itself to be the like to sur surpass if it has not already. I, I mean, last time I checked, I think it was right about to surpass the US in GDP. And in terms of when you look at the chart of China's economic growth versus the US, you you, you look at the, the kind of like the historic charts and the US is kind of like teetering slowly. And then you have China, which in the last like 10 years is just like, Massive you know, growth. boomed, it just boomed yeah. upwards. Mm. And it's incredible to see like how their, their growth and uh, they're definitely positioned to surpass the U.S. if they haven't already, to be honest. So, the the, the, the yeah. thing that China and Russia have done, Russia has actually surprised me. China, I, I was expecting, but Russia has really surprised me. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't I didn't think they they would be this strategic. They have been they've actually been incredibly strategic. But China is, um, you know, it 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 it's been playing. They've been playing a very long game. They've been playing a very long game for the last 15 years, and so has Russia. Russia, I wasn't aware of. I didn't know that they'd been playing such a long game. So a lot of these things that are now coming out, coming out, they've clearly been they've clearly been planned for a very long time, mm -hmm. and they second guessed a lot of uh, America's moves. China is uh, very careful about how open or, or public they are about uh, what is wh what they're up to or what they're getting on with. They're, I think, I don't know if they're just nervous or they're just being keeping the cards close to the chest for whatever, whatever reason, I don't know. But Russia has been a lot more open about it. It's kind of has been kind of more brazen or more blatant about it. And then China is kind of doing things kind of uh, in lockstep with Russia and coming out of the shadows at once Russia does it. So this, this you know, I know this has been, it's been big news about how Saudi is uh, now exchanging um, uh, oil with uh, China and Yuan instead of in the US dollar. That thing's been in place for two years. Mm. It's only just coming out in the open out and they're saying, oh, they're intending to do it. No, they've been doing it for quite some time, which is what's been getting America so riled up for so long. Mm -hmm. um, but China's not that vocal about these things. Yeah, it's interesting. So it's, it's really interesting to look at how China operates because it's, um, you know, of course, it's a government that has a lot of, uh, it imposes a lot of restrictions on its people and it is very secretive and it is very closed and there's so much surveillance and um it is in fact you know a country where people are very restricted but then you look at the government and you look at the way that it operates and there's kind of like this uh yin and yang right mm. where like the, the there is you know the the dark side which is like all of the restrictions and like you know the the hidden like uh kind of the, well the, the lack of freedom of speech and like mm. you know the, the hidden people that kind of disappear and you know the, the the behind the bars activity that you don't really see but then on the other side there is there is this kind of very clear um intention that you see with how they're operating to make china into like a superpower and really yeah. make it into an extremely powerful country and to bring their people like as you mentioned like the latest technology the latest developments and if you look at if you look at like um you know cities uh, and you look at like beijing and all these different cities uh, i mean it's it's the the way that you they look right now when, when you if you ever go visit it's like way more advanced than New York City or any other city that you've yeah. seen in the world, right? Yeah. Um, so it's just really interesting to see. To well, you don't, you don't see it on Instagram or yeah. on Twitter. You don't see any of, you know, you, when you get there is you realize how far ahead they are. I mean, yeah. you can go you can go into a shop in China and you, you know, the shop has shutters on it and you tap your phone and the shutters open and you go in and you pick one item up and you tap again with your phone to pay for it and you walk out and the shutters come right back down. There's nobody actually servicing uh, the store. Mm -hmm. You know, and they've got cameras everywhere to make sure everything, you know, th they just put the product in and off they go. I mean, uh, the US, the UK, Canada, we are like 20 years away from from that kind of eventuality. You know, yeah. we're nowhere near that. 
but we we are seen as uh, we're the leaders of the free world and we are so mm -hmm. far ahead but it's not true mm -hmm. it's just an illusion that's been created it's largely a by it's, you know, yeah it's a narrative it's yeah. a narrative correct correct yeah. it is a but narrative. china's lifted 800 million people out of poverty right they've lifted a lot of people out of poverty and they have got dark sides who yeah. hasn't yeah but they i think what i think they're trying to uh neutralize the darkness i think mm -hmm. but it's not an easy thing to do when you have such a large population you have such a uh, a long history it's not an easy thing to do but the difference between china and the us for example is china is going to other countries and doing trade with them it's not looking to colonize them whereas the us the uk france belgium you know these other countries they all went around colonizing other countries china's mm -hmm. not doing that it's only doing trade with them mm -hmm. right so this, we could we could talk about this all day to be honest yeah, with you. Yeah, it's such an interesting it. conversation. I I love this, and I I'm really excited that uh, that we we went in that direction. And I think I totally want to bring you back on. We could like sit sure. down, dissect all of this. Would be amazing. Uh, but I know I also want to respect your time uh, that you've given to me today. So if we could kind of wrap this up with you know someone who's listening to this, and I'm sure it was an interesting conversation for anyone um, who takes the time to 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 really listen to what we just spoken about. If we bring it back to where they are now and what we can kind of give them as parting advice, right? Given the economic climate that we currently live in and the developments that are currently happening around the world, for an entrepreneur that is starting off in business, uh, what is what, what can we give them as one of the main things or the main thing that they should be focusing on or that they should be conscious of you know, around the world today in terms of economic developments when it comes to their own business? Okay. Um, I mean, it... it a lot of people consider this quite controversial, but mm -hmm. you, we, we are in, we're in the midst of the, the the biggest macroeconomic change in history in our mm -hmm. lifetimes, right? So at the at the the um, at the change of the the twentieth century, there was a new world order that came in. So you had you know you had the U.S. and then you had the you had the U.K. and the U.S. and there was a, it was the dominance of the dollar, and all these things came in. That is now changing. A lot of people find it very hard to believe that the dollar is about to go bye bye. You know, it's not no longer going to have any dominance, and there's going to be a huge shift in terms of tech as well, right? Because if if the dollar is dominant, then then the dollar based tech is going to be dominant as well. Apple and Tesla and all of these things. We are we are right in the middle of that shift right now. How long that shift is going to take? I don't know. Is it going to take a month? Is it going to take a year? Is it going to take ten years? I have no clue. But we're right in the middle of it. If you, there are a number of businesses that don't have to necessarily be so concerned with what's going on macroeconomically. It can kind of be done. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of businesses. If you want to anchor yourself or position yourself, you've got to position yourself for the new power block. Mm -hmm. The new power block is Russia, Turkey, Iran, and China together. And whatever you've been told about them, whatever you believe about them, whatever you feel about them, that, you know, Erdogan is not sincere for the Muslims and China's oppressing China is locking Muslims up and Russia, Russia is a dictatorship and fascism and Iran is whatever Iran is. I don't even know what the criticism of Iran is. Mm -hmm. All of these narratives have been built by the West because they know that this power block is coming. And there will be other countries that will circle and will be within this orbit as well. So Kazakhstan and Indonesia and possibly Malaysia, Thailand, Venezuela, Argentina, these kind of countries, they're all going to be in this orbit and we're going to get a new power block. And so you've got to look at what this power block is doing and you've got to align yourself to that power block. Mm -hmm. That's what you've got to do. The biggest thing, if I can say one thing, which I think a lot of people will find quite offensive, I'm not, I'm not trying to offend people, but it is on the nose, is you can make a hundred uh, uh, excuses for people and you can make a hundred criticism for people, right? Nobody is perfect. You, you know, people say, well, Biden has done this, but he's also done this. And nobody nobody looks at Biden and goes, yeah, but he's done all these things. He's gone into this country and he's gone and done this. But you say, okay, well, look, Turkey is launching, Turkey is collaborating with China right now, is launching the blockchain. They're thinking of going back onto the gold standard. They're trying to peg the lira back to the gold standard, which will solve a lot of inflationary issues. They're creating a lot of infrastructure. They're doing a whole host of stuff. And you say that to the people and say, yeah, but he allowed, he allowed a certain country to come to the to to is a turkey and then they played the anthem and i don't like him anymore <laughs> okay right. who are you going to find that's 100 percent perfect you're not going to mm -hmm. find anybody and if you allow yourself to get to get broiled down with that you're going to miss all the opportunities mm -hmm. right correct turkey is launching their blockchain uh, system in collaboration with the with um with china they're gonna they're probably gonna solve these inflationary issues that we're all gonna experience in the west canada australia uk america is in for a really hard time 
So if you're going to get yourself bogged down with these kind of things, and I'm not saying that's not a big deal, but if you allow that to get in the way when there's so many other people, so many other leaders that are causing us so much aggro, we're not going to get anywhere. Yeah. So, you know, you've got to just, you've got to focus on what are the good things that they're doing and how can you align yourself towards that? Mm -hmm. Because you're not going to find a perfect leader. Yeah. You're not going to find a perfect country and there's going to be a huge shift of tech. So you've got to keep your ears and eyes open for that. Mm -hmm. 100%. I really appreciate you sharing that, uh, Brother Khuram. And I think just, you know, those those parting words were so valuable and so insightful. And definitely ones that I th I will be considering myself within our business as well. And this is why I love to have these conversations, because I think first and foremost, I benefit from having these conversations. And I love that. So Jazakallah Khair for joining me on the podcast. Where should people go if they want to support you? Uh, where do you want to take them if they want to go learn more about Kedad? Wherever it is you want them to go. So, um, go if they're, so I mean, we, we, the investor fund is building up pretty well at the moment. So I'm not, in, I'm not looking for more investors. But if there are, if there are if, in, in, in your audience, if there are any genuine businesses mm -hmm. that are dealing with inventory, so actual physical stock of stuff, mm -hmm. that need a capital injection to allow them to buy more uh, um, inventory, then please ask them to go to the website, which is called commenderfinance.com. So commenda is the Italian or the European word for Kirad, basically. Okay. Because it was a big deal in Europe as well. So commenda, which is C-O-M-E-N-D-A, finance.com. There's an application form there. Click on the application form. That's it. That's the one. Awesome. And um, fill, the, uh, fill the application form in. And if your business uh, meets the funding criteria, inshallah, we'll get you the investment for your awesome. business. So we'll make sure to include that link below in the description, whether you're listening yeah. on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, check the episode notes, or if you're on YouTube, check the description. We'll make sure to include those. And we'll include as well what you mentioned earlier in the episode. You mentioned a reference to uh, your talk that you had, yes. right? Uh, yes. So we'll be including that as well in the links, guys. So go ahead and check that out. Quran, thank you so much for joining us, man. This Thanks was an episode me. that was long awaited definitely worth okay. the wait brother so just like right. i'm glad you like it okay <laughs> just like khair. so guys you know the drill if you enjoyed the episode make sure to leave a rating and review of the episode let us know why you love it and you know what kind of guests you want to see on this podcast and of course go ahead and support us at Omerpreneur as well search up Omerpreneur on your favorite social platform go ahead and give us a follow and you can connect with us there until the next episode we'll see you next time assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh